welcome everyone. My name is Jeffrey Michaels. I am the IEN Senior Fellow in American Foreign Policy and International Security at eBay. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion, A New American Civil War, Realistic Possibility or Fantasy? This event is part of a uh, series at eBay that looks at American uh, foreign and security policy issues that's sponsored by the North American Studies Institute of Barcelona. Now, by way of introducing this panel, I'd like to go back to a, a Wall Street Journal article that I came across back in 2010, someone had sent me, and it was essentially a profile of a Russian uh, professor named Igor Panarin, who had this idea about some sort of civil war and a breakup of the United States into about half a dozen parts. And at the time I read this, I thought, you know, this is, this is crazy. Uh, it's impossible to conceive of another civil war in the United States. There's absolutely zero chance of this happening. Now, although I think that sort of, you know, parts of his thesis are still impossible, for example, Texas joining Mexico, uh, I think, you know, the more general theme of a civil war, uh, something that was, I think, previously considered unthinkable uh, is now very much thinkable. Uh, it can no longer be dismissed as impossible. Yeah. The fact of, you know, the, I think the, so the, the, the fact that this issue has received a great deal of attention in the last few years, uh, and especially after the January 6th assault on the Capitol, marks a great change from the days when we took the political stability of the United States more or less for granted. Nowadays, according to some public opinion surveys, there is quite a large percentage of Americans, perhaps 30% or more, who believe that civil war is inevitable and possibly imminent in the next couple of years with political polarization, political radicalization, culture wars, contested elections, and lots of guns, yeah, uh, you know, surely this is a recipe for disaster. So what are we to make of this, all this sort of talk of, of, of civil war? Is it pure hype? Something we'll forget about in a couple of years? We're gonna sort of sit back a couple of years from now laughing, how on earth could we have been so silly and so stupid? Uh, and, and so forth, were we out of our minds? What sort of drugs were we on thinking that we could actually have a civil war? Or is it something that we should be taking seriously, especially in the academic community? Now, obviously, the implosion of the United States, if that is what we are talking about, would have major geopolitical, economic, and all sorts of other implications uh, around the world, probably of much greater global and historical significance than the collapse of the Soviet Union. On the other hand, is that really what we're talking about? Is civil war even the right term to use? Or can we expect something much more low key? Lots of low level, lots, lots of low level violence, shootings, bombings, but basically the system remains intact. The economy continues to function more or less normally. The federal government continues to function more or less normally. The United States remains more or less united and so forth. In other words, what sort of scenarios do we have in mind? What does a new civil war actually look like? Because if we don't have some kind of idea of what we're dealing with, and how on earth can we assess its likelihood to say nothing of attempts to prevent it or mitigate its consequences? Instead, should we be thinking more in terms of riots, civil disturbances, civil strife, maybe relatively low levels of political violence, insurgency, a bit of terrorism? Or are we thinking more in terms of outright separatism, massive amounts of violence, or you know something in between, or something else entirely? What sort of historical reference points are actually even useful for thinking about this. Should we be thinking about uh, the Civil War that lasted from 1861 to 1865? Or should we be thinking more in terms of, uh, say, the political violence that occurred after the Civil War during the period of Reconstruction, or say, during the 1960s and 70s? Uh, even, or even to use sort of a non-American analogy. Should we be thinking about Lebanon? Should we be thinking about the Balkans? What analogies are actually useful? And likewise, all sorts of, sort of questions are raised. What, what is the trigger for a civil war? Is there a trigger? Does everything collapse overnight? Or are we talking about a process th that develops over years? Does it even matter which political party is in power? And sort of so on and so forth. Now, there have been a number of books in recent years that have touched on this issue, both nonfiction as well as fiction. Uh, Barbara Walters' How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them is probably the best, sort of most well-known political science text. The Canadian writer, Stephen Marsh, uh, he wrote The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future, and this has also received a great deal of attention. Uh, and of course, the best of the lot, uh, certainly the most well-written is Ken Kalfas' uh, 2 a.m. in Little America. Now, one reason I was sort of very glad that Ken was uh, able to join us today is because I think, you know, no offense intended, but there's some limits to political scientists, or at least what we can say about the future. 
Uh, yes, we can set the context and occasionally offer some useful insights, but I've often found that writers of fiction can often help us think through things that we would not, or, you know, think about things we wouldn't otherwise think about to provide us with some sort of vision of the future, uh, uh, sort of the shape of things to come, if you'll forgive the H.G. Wells reference. So the way that I've, I've, I've organized this panel, each of the speakers will make an opening statement of about eight to 10 minutes. Uh, I'll briefly respond at the end and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so before handing over to our speakers, let me just quickly give uh, an introduction. So uh, to start, uh, Julie Norman is an associate professor in politics and international relations at the University, at University College London. And she's also co-director of the UCL Center of US Politics. She's an expert on US politics, on the Middle East, and political violence more generally. And she's the author of four books, multiple articles and op-eds, and a frequent contributor to the BBC, Al Jazeera, CNN, and Bloomberg. Next, we'll have Andrew Gothorp, who's based at the University of Leiden, where he researches and teaches US history and politics. He's currently the principal investigator of a rather large project on American foreign policy and liberalism. In addition to his academic publications, Andy's work also appears in the media, especially The Guardian. Uh, he also hosts a podcast Ameri about American politics, uh, foreign policy and culture called America Explained, which I can highly recommend, uh, as well as a Substack. Uh, next we'll have uh, Emma Long, who's an associate professor of American history and politics at the University of East Anglia. Her work focuses on a number of topics that are, I think, especially relevant to today's topic, including the role of religion in US politics, gun control, or perhaps lack of controls by a better way of putting it, uh, the US legal system and the US constitution. <laughs> and lastly, uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, Ken Kalfas uh, is a writer based in Philadelphia. Uh, 2 AM in Little America is his most recent novel, which is absolutely superb and I cannot recommend highly enough. In fact, it was pretty much largely as a result of, of reading this novel that I was inspired to organize this event, because among other things, I was sort of fascinated by the vision this uh, sort of, you know, he has in this book, sort of this future of the United States in which rather than being a home of refugees, the United States is the source for refugees. And I can also highly recommend uh, Ken's Coup de Foudre, a satirical novella about the scandal involving the former IMF director, Dominic Strauss-Kahn. So with that, I think I will turn it over to uh, Julie. Great, thank you so much, Jeff, for the introduction, and thank you to eBay and IEN for hosting the event. I think I speak for all the panelists that um, we're delighted to be here and delighted to see all of you in person and also online. Um, this is obviously a very timely question and topic, I think, for the US and for the world, and I would say it's a very compelling one for me personally as well. As Jeff mentioned in the introduction, I work on political violence quite broadly, so when I'm not Working on the US, I'm often based in places where there actually are civil wars currently going on or are recently uh, emerging, societies recently emerging from civil wars. So it may be because of that that I push back a bit at the uh, prediction that the US will go in a civil war kind of direction or that that's the kind of term we should be using. I'm not sure it's the most accurate term to use and I also worry that it might, one, stoke tensions further and also distract us from real risks for increased political violence, extremism, or civil unrest that, that Jeff also alluded to. So I'll start by just saying a few, um, kind of uh, countering some of the claims that have been made by some of the recent books that Jeff mentioned about why, uh, why some do see a civil war coming. I think one of the main claims that's often put forward is that civil wars happen when democracy is weak and many people see the US in that kind of weak democracy position. I would agree that civil wars happen when democracy is weak, and I would definitely see that the US has experienced democratic backsliding in the last few years, and we should take that quite seriously. But I don't see the US democracy as weakened to the point that I and others have observed in civil war contexts, and I don't see it getting to that point just yet. When we look at democracy indicators, Procedurally, we still see voting at record levels, 
Substantively, we still see people engaging in public protest, in free expression, using the media quite broadly. So in general, as well as more specific terms, I think US democracy is holding relatively stable, even though it has taken some hits that we need to take seriously. And whether that's gerrymandering, culture wars, but I don't see those as particularly new or particularly severe for us. The democracy uh, claim also is often linked with the idea that trust in institutions or trust in government is lower than it's been in decades. This is another thing that I would say is true in the US. We can see that from the data. But if you take a historical view of this, trust in government is lower than it's been in decades, but that's largely because the biggest drop off was in the 1970s after Watergate and after Vietnam, and it simply hasn't really recovered since then. It's been a gradual decline. So again, this is something we should take seriously and try and address, but to me, this is not some immediate new stark threat that's just emerged in the last three to five years that's going to send us off a civil war kind of cliff. So I've spoken about weak democracy. Another claim that's sometimes made for the civil war argument is that civil wars are likely in places with ethnic factionalization. So when you have certain ethnic groups, two or more, that are at odds with each other. Again, I can say confidently from places where I've worked that very much often is a factor. In the US, again, I don't see it to that level of severity or newness. Obviously, the US has a long history of racial tensions that we should, again, look at quite seriously, and there's so much work to be done. But I would say the US is probably doing better in that area than we ever have before in our history. And quite crucially, we're increasingly seeing racial and ethnic diffusion, or some might say scrambling across the political party. So, for example, Donald Trump made inroads with um, pretty much every racial and ethnic demographic in 2020 from what he did in 2016, which means that more African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans are voting for the Republican Party, and we see a much more diverse Republican Party. So I, I push back at that a little bit. Some say that political factionalization in the US is similar to ethnic factionalization elsewhere. My research and others shows that, in fact, political polarization is our biggest divide. It outweighs racial, class, other kinds of divides that we have. But I would again say it's different. Political identity is something you can opt into and quite crucially opt out of. And that's very different than, say, an ethnic diversity. And also most people, with some exceptions on, on the, the strong left and the strong right, don't usually put their partisan identity as their core number one identity. Um, so I, I don't see that playing as much of a, a kind of equivalent to ethnic factionalization as we actually see in civil wars. And finally, the third claim that we often hear from some of the authors that Jeff mentioned is that civil war is likely when there's an experience of relative deprivation, when people feel a grievance, they feel like they're not getting their fair share and others are getting ahead of them. Again, this is a problem in the US right now and it should not be discounted. I think it's much of what's driving the MAGA movement, uh, support for certain politicians, but again, I would say to me, this is not to the level of civil war, and partly that's because in absolute terms, most Americans are still doing relatively pretty well compared to much of the world, to the extent that as much as they may want to disrupt the system or shake it up, most do not want to dismantle it completely, and there's something that they want to preserve within that rather than try and change it. So those are just some general kind of pushbacks to, again, some of the main claims, weak democracy, ethnic factionalization, and, uh, and grievance that are sometimes underpinning the Civil War argument that I don't think stand up so strongly. What I focus on more is what I see as actual real threats of increased political violence, civil unrest, perhaps violent extremism. Um, I expect this would probably be more likely to be episodic rather than a war, which I consider to be much more all-encompassing and happening all the time. Likely more like a January 6th kind of incident that emerges specifically around an election, especially if we have another um, contested election. I think we will see many episodes of this type again. I'm also watchful for cycles of violence. Um, I think we're rightly paying more attention to militia groups, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, what have you, but you don't need even militias if people are starting to see violence happening and want to get retribution. And so we start seeing cycles of violence in these situations. So I'm mindful of watching out for that. And finally, I'm focusing on trying to take the fear of civil war 
quite seriously. We've seen from recent polls that over 40% of Americans think some kind of civil war is somewhat likely. Over 60% expect some type of political violence. And I just, I think it's important because this fear and this perception threat, uh, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy if we don't try and rein it in, and I think, I, I at least feel like sort of some sort of a responsibility to rein it in. Um, and it especially can take hold if people are convinced that the other side is going to use violence. And recent studies have shown this. If Democrats think that Republicans are more likely to use violence than Democrats themselves say that they would be more likely to take some kind of action or, or um, see uh, uh, um, political violence as permissible. So I think we need to watch some of that kind of language. Um, so I would just like to focus finally on how can we mitigate some of this? I don't see political violence as inevitable, even though I see it as a more likely trajectory than say a civil war. Um, I look at both buffers and constraints. I would say for buffers, things that would kind of help us um, uh, protect us a bit from some of these potential incidents. I do think many US institutions, though threatened under January 6th, um, have mostly held up, and especially very key ones like the military, like the courts, and Emma might have more to say on that in a few minutes, um, rule of law. I would note that there's been over 1,000 arrests for the events of January 6th with very high profile prosecutions for high level crimes like seditious cons conspiracy. So this is not something that happened in the US and we just devolve from there. There's accountability being um, carried out at this moment. I'm encouraged by acts of Congress like the Electoral Count Reform Act, which have tried to close some of the loopholes that, that Trump was able to, um, uh, to, to utilize and to exploit uh, in 2020. So I think that is one thing, as I mentioned, the economy. I think when the economy is doing well and doing better, that helps give us a little bit more padding against um, political violence out, uh, breaking out. Um, and I would say public will is important too. Um, you don't need that many people to cause political violence, which is a problem. You can have 99.9% .9 of the population against it, and you don't need that many to cause a problem. But with that said, I think the 2022 midterm showed that most of the political spectrum, right and left, um, does not want to return to January 6th or election denialism. So we'll see if that holds it we get, as we get closer to 2024. Um, but as many said, I think 2022 was a small D democratic success in pushing back at some of that. Where I see some of the potential facilitators for political violence, um, some are tactical or um, more procedural. The fact that we don't really have a good domestic counterterrorism policy in the United States. Um, our federal, state, and local levels tend to work quite differently, and we don't have good coordination for preventing violent extremism or for law enforcement around those kinds of activities. We have a high prevalence of firearms in the United States, which is very well, well known and, and often uh, referenced in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, and organization is very easy on social media these days. So that is something that I think is new and different. Um, and on the cultural level and political level, I would say rhetoric does matter. Um, you know, some of us were talking last night, would this topic still be as salient if Trump was not in the picture again? I do think that Mr. Trump's rhetoric um, is, uh, you know, very um, mobilizing and salient uh, on many of these issues. I would note also that the left also, I think, has responsibilities here too. Um, I think the focus has rightly been on, on Mr. Trump and many of his allies, but the left also has a responsibility to condemn violence if and when it happens. I think Biden has been increasingly strong about that, of avoiding hyperbole, and I think quite crucially, avoiding um, lumping anyone who uh, takes any position that we disagree with um, and labeling them as an extremist or, or as, as something that's, uh, that might lead to civil war. Um, so I'll just close by saying um, I don't see civil war as inevitable or likely, but I'm really glad for events like this to talk about what might actually be real threats. I think it's important not to be too complacent. I put myself in that category of probably being too complacent pre-January 6th, but I think it's important not to be overly alarmist as well and rather to have conversations like this where we can actually unpack what the risks might look like and how we might prevent them. Thank you. Okay, well, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I want to begin by thanking Jeff for organising this event, and, and you all for being here. And uh, thank you for those remarks, Julia, which I, you know, I think set the scene really well. And I agree with um, 
Julia's conclusion that I also am very skeptical of this idea that there could be some kind of American civil war, but I think that we need to think very carefully about the current place of political violence in American politics and, and the way that that might go in the future. I think that being said, I'm going to indulge in thinking through for a few minutes just hypothetically what a new American civil war might look like, because I think that helps to clarify and, and build on some of the points that you made. And I think the starting point for doing that has to be think, to think about the previous American Civil War, because I think that's what comes to people's mind, of course, when they hear the phrase American Civil War. And just to think through this analogy a little bit. So I don't think most people today, even the people who are advancing this idea that there may be a new American Civil War, imagine that it will be like the last one. But I think that by carrying out that comparison, we understand a little more what is being, dis is, is, is being discussed here. So, you know, as I, I think you all remember from history class, the first American Civil War involved, you know, pretty much half of the country seceding from the other half, establishing a rival government in Virginia, and then fielding armies that actually went into the field and fought against the, you know, the, the constitutional government. So civil wars like this, it's like clear lines on a map, rival governments and armies marching around right now. Nobody, I think, is really thinking that Donald Trump is going to like declare Mar-a-Lago to be the capital of, you know, whatever, whatever you might call it, the magnated states of America or something, right? We be, and, uh, be, that um, he's not going to be putting rebel armies into the field against the, against the U.S. Army, right? And there are some reasons to 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 understand why today that model of civil war just is not really possible or, or likely in the U.S. So I'm just gonna focus on two really briefly. The first is to think a little bit about where the divisions are right now in American society. And the second is to think about how the nature of the American state has changed and the nature of the American military has changed. So the American Civil War was a sectional conflict. The South, you know, a geographically contiguous area seceded from the rest of the country. And the main, you know, this war was a little bit more complicated than it's, it's sometimes portrayed to be because there were still slave states that remained in the Union and their allegiance was sometimes up for grabs. But it was pretty much a, a war of, of, of two clearly delineated sides. And that was the most salient division in American politics in the 1860s. Nowadays, the salient divisions in American politics are, are not sectional. They cut, they're not regional. They cut, cut through every single state every single city, every single town in the nation. So the biggest dividing lines in American politics today are not geography or, or where one lives, but they are education and to a slightly lesser extent, but still a very important extent, race. And this often in terms of political geography maps onto population density. So if you look at a map of who votes for who in, in every presidential election, you can look, for instance, at a state like Wyoming. Wyoming is the state that Donald Trump won by the biggest margin in, in 2020. Still 25% of the people in Wyoming voted for Democrats and geographically they're concentrated in two, two towns in that nation. California, opposite story, California is the state that Joe Biden carried by the largest percentage in 2020. California also has conservative areas. 35% of Californians still voted for Donald Trump in, in, in that election. So even though these um, political divisions that exist today in America are profound and worryingly deep, they just don't map onto geography in the same way. So if we were imagining some sort of conflict in America, it's not between one region and another, it's happening inside every county, inside every state, and that would give it, as I'll discuss shortly, a very, very different character. The other thing that's really changed since the, um, since the 1860s is the nature of the American state and the nature of military power. So military power in the 1860s when the American Civil War happened was, now Jeff's a much more accomplished historian of war than I am, so hopefully you won't correct me on this, but military power in that decade was essentially about, about three things, rifles, artillery, and railroads. All of those things could be constructed by both sides. At the outset of the conflict, the, the, the federal armed forces that became the Union armed forces were very small. It was, it was very possible for the Confederacy, even though they were outmatched ultimately in the end, to field an army that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Union forces. Now, nowadays, the nature of the US state has just completely changed, and whoever has control of that state 
has control of overwhelming military forces and overwhelming intelligence capabilities, which are very, very important as well. Entities like the National Security Agency, like the FBI, like the CIA, which isn't supposed to have a domestic role, but we can imagine that it might do in, in, in this scenario. So Donald Trump's magnated states of America cannot um, you know, it can't manufacture F-18s, right? It can't set up a national intelligence agency. So unless there's a, a split within the American armed forces, you can't really imagine the military basis for, for, for a conflict that in some way resembles what, what we saw in the 1860s. Now, the American military does have a problem with infiltration by far-right individuals and extremist individuals, but there is not, you know, this this has been happening for a long time. There's no evidence that it's the case that that you know like the first infantry division is suddenly going to defect to MAGA in the event of a civil war. Right? This is not something that exists where the, you know they dominate within particular units. So it's very difficult to imagine uh, that kind of split within the U.S. military. Although, as as I'll talk about in a second, it's it's a little bit of a different case with states um, and local police and, and law enforcement agencies. So if we do imagine what an American Civil War hypothetically might look like, we would be talking about a very, very decentralized conflict. We would be talking about one in which there were probably many, many different local militias, local insurgent groups across the nation that were trying to challenge um, the federal government. They would be fighting probably with one another, also with... Um, a mixture of federal and state and local uh, law enforcement agencies. It's a possible, again, um, hypothetically, that some of these agencies might go over to the side of the rebellion. I mean, we have seen, uh, you know, in, in, 20, in the summer of 2020, we saw that local police often sided with far-right militias and, and the Proud Boys and et cetera. So, you know, okay, th this, this may happen on, on some level. And most of the scenarios that um, supporters of this thesis that there may be another civil war are advancing is that this is what it will look like and that eventually you know there will be so many distinct challenges to government authority all over the United States that the federal government will lose the ability to, to take control of the situation and it will perhaps have to cede territory and control. Now it is true that the US military has proven very uh, unsuccessful at fighting insurgencies like this in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? It's true that many veterans of those wars or some veterans of those wars go and join these militias and join these organizations. So, you know, you can see that perhaps there is some, um, some basis for thinking that, that this scenario might be plausible. Now, I don't believe that it's plausible. And the main reason that I don't believe it's plausible is because I currently see no evidence that there are enough dedicated individuals and enough competent, dedicated organizations across the, the US to carry out this kind of difficult, sustained battle with the central state. So there are definitely many kinds of groups that can engage in appalling acts of right-wing violence, like January 6th. This is something we've seen before in US history, like the Tulsa race riot, you know, and, and, and other events like that. But it's very hard for me to imagine that there might be this kind of sustained insurgency and that the capability of these groups to wage some kind of sustained insurgency could emerge without the US government breaking them up long before they, they reached this, this goal. So, you know, after um, January 6, a member of the Oath Keepers organization was, was flying back to Texas after um, taking part in January 6, and he was texting other members of the group, and he said, now this is civil war, we're in civil war. Well, guess where that guy is right now? He's serving life in federal prison, as are most of the other members of, 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 of his organization. And they, so, so, you know, I'm saying that these groups just are not, I think, a match for the resources of the federal government. But this is where you know, I, I completely kind of dovetail with the point that Julie made here, which is that it is absolutely right, despite that, to worry about political violence in the United States. But what makes that violence very concerning is not, in a way, the violence itself, but the way that it can be used alongside other means to generate constitutional crises and attempt to illegitimately seize political power. What made January 6th 
not just an appalling event that could have ended in so much worse bloodshed, what made it not just that, but made it an attempted coup was the fact that it was part of an effort by Donald Trump and people around him to hold on to political power in extra constitutional ways. You don't gain political power simply by seizing physical control of Congress, right? Even if you actually take control of that building, that doesn't mean you're in charge of the country, right? There has to be some kind of legal, political, constitutional maneuvering of which this violence could be a part. And that's, it. oh sorry, I'm probably running out of time, Jeff, but one, but you know that if, if you look at, and again, Julie, Julie is a much, well, I'm not at all an expert on, on the political violence and, and, and coups in, um, in the global south, but from my reading of the history of many coups in the global south, people often focus on the violence and what's happening in the streets, but that's only one part of the story. It's also what elites are doing behind closed doors. It's also the maneuvering that's taking place there. So I guess my final message is that no, the Proud Boys cannot overthrow American democracy, but the Proud Boys plus Donald Trump can overthrow American democracy. But that's not a civil war, that's something else. And I think we absolutely do need to be very, very focused on that danger, and, and I'm very scared about it, as I can talk about more during the Q&A, but it wouldn't be a civil war, in my view. So that's, those are my remarks. Hey, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, thanks to everybody for being here, to uh, eBay and to the, uh, the IEN for the opportunity to, to come to Barcelona for the first time um, and uh, to speak to everybody. I, to be clear, I, I agree with both Julie and, uh, and Andy here in that I don't think there's an imminent civil war due in the, the US. Um, but I also think that um, most Americans in 1860 didn't necessarily think there was an imminent civil war <laughs> coming either. Um, and that there was a spark that lit tensions that already existed. Um, and that trying to understand those tensions in that historical context becomes important for thinking uh, about the contemporary political um, issues and also just by drawing parallels with the with the civil war but other historical elements it helps us to think through the state of contemporary american politics perhaps in a slightly different way so i'm a historian so you'll perhaps forgive me if i think less about what's about immediately going to happen and think perhaps about a couple of historical parallels that i thought were, were quite interesting when i was thinking about this um and I came across a, an interesting quote when I was doing some research here. It was from um, Robert Reich, writing in the, the Guardian, who said that he thought that the tensions in the United States were, in his words, analogous to unhappily married people who don't want to go through the trauma of formal divorce. Um, so, you know, the idea that maybe a civil war is an imminent, but there's some kind of fracturing going on within the, the country that I think we need to take seriously. Um, but I wanted to start with my personal favorite subject, which is the US Supreme Court, which has hardly been quiet in recent years. Um, and because of that, it's become one of the big sort of focuses of the debates about tensions in American politics, about since uh, Donald Trump appointed three new justices in four years by means that were somewhat less than acceptable in some cases. Um, the courts become a focus, a sort of a lightning rod for tensions. Um, and this was fueled in addition by people like Mitch McConnell, who worked with, with Trump to, to get the nominees sue, talking about the Supreme Court almost as part of the political spoils. So we won the election, we get to make these nominations. The court is much more like the elected branches of government than a, a court. We should have control of it. It's our, our right. Um, we've begun to see the consequences of, of that. So um, Dobbs versus Jackson, women's health last summer, the overturning of Roe v. Uh, Roe v. Wade and access to abortion. Also rulings on guns um, and access to guns um as well as things like religious freedom 
um, and the power of the federal government, actually, thinking about that as part of this. There are some big cases that are currently coming up too. Uh, in fact, I was just checking before I came here to make sure that the Supreme Court hadn't actually handed down decisions in any of them because they're, they're imminent. But things like affirmative action, uh, again, religious rights, LGBTQ rights, um, states' rights and, and race. So all of these are big issues that are going to put the Supreme Court back in the center of what are loosely considered to be the, the culture of wars in the US. Um, which sort of suggests that the, the court is playing a role in raising tensions, um, all of which got me thinking about the Civil War and um, the, the context of the, the Civil War. Um, so in 1857, the court handed down, which almost every generation subsequently has argued was the worst, the single worst decision it has made in its entire history in a case called Dred Scott versus Samford. In the, the case, the, or the opinion effectively held that black Americans were never considered to be citizens of the United States and could not become citizens of the United States against the backdrop of rising tensions about the extension of, of slavery, both its existence and potential extension. Um, it ruled that slaves, the enslaved people, were property and property rights were protected by the Constitution. Um, and that Congress didn't have the power to uh, prevent the extension of slavery, which just rode roughshod over political compromises that had, had been put in place over the, last, the previous 30 years. Now, this would have been bad enough, given the tensions around the issues, and, but although the justices were really divided, on this, the core of those who made the decision were five Southern slave-owning justices, which gave the impression that the Supreme Court had been captured by slave-owning interests and effectively had taken a side on this big, bitter political issue that politicians and the public hadn't managed to find a, a resolution for. So you begin to see commentary about uh, it's their court, not our court. They've taken over, it the court can't be trusted. Um, now, Dred Scott is often somewhat lazily referred to as the case that sparked the Civil War. Clearly it didn't. It was three years earlier. It's not really a spark if it takes that long to, to go. But it did have an important role to play in raising tensions and in... Um, I guess in um, raising questions, people begin to lose trust in the institutions of, of government. And ultimately, the court got to a point where it, it couldn't do its job because people didn't trust it anymore. Um, just wanted to, to give you a quote from a scholar called G. Edward White, who's written one of the great books on the, the US Supreme Court, talking about Dred Scott versus Sanford. And I think it speaks to parallels with contemporary politics. So he wrote, the striking aspect of the commentary about Dred Scott was its tendency to regard the decision as a venture by the court into politics rather than as an ordinary opinion. Both friends and critics of the court called it an attempt by the court to thrust itself into political contests. If you follow any of the recent decisions by the Supreme Court, this is sounding horribly familiar. Um, opponents of the decision, White wrote, called for a remodeling of the court Supporters suggested that resistance to the decision was tantamount to treason. Now, I'm not sure anyone's calling the justices treasonous at the moment, but the idea that the court needs reform, the court isn't working on behalf of the American people, was part of the discussion in the aftermath of Dred Scott and is very much part of the discussion that is going on now. Uh, the Chief Justice of the time, uh, Taney, thought he had the power to resolve an issue that the political system couldn't resolve and found himself very, very wrong. Um, uh, hubris a little bit on his part, I think. Um, I'm not suggesting that the court is about to hand down a decision this summer or next summer or summer after that will be the spark that would start another civil war, but I do think it's important to understand that the Supreme Court currently in is, is in a position and being talked about in ways that are not that dissimilar to the way that the court was being talked about in the immediate, the, the years immediately before the, the Civil War. So 
if there is going to be a civil war, and I'm not sure if there there is or is particularly, um, but it's it's playing a part in raising the tensions that is going to to be part of what uh, what would spark off. Okay, just quickly to draw on a different historical parallel, um, and I can't claim. Uh, ownership of, of this, I found it when I was doing some research a couple of years ago, and I liked the idea, well, not liked the idea, I thought the idea was interesting. Um, a number of commentators have talked about the idea of what's happening in the United States as a cold civil war. So seeing it less as a parallel to the civil war of the 19th century and more as a parallel to the Cold War, which dominated obviously the second half of the 20th century with the idea that um, there are just t different ideologies, in that case two, so in the US perhaps more than, than two, who can't, because they, they are speaking different languages and they are talking past each other and they can't find a place in the middle where they can agree on, on things. So the, here, this is where the, the parallel of the, the idea of the civil war comes in. We're beginning to see it. Um, then these divisions are not new. Um, but they are heightening. Um, abortion is is one issue where, where we're seeing this. The overturning of Roe versus Wade and the return of abortion issues to the states means we're seeing greater division at state level um, and very different language used about it. The women's choice in one way, the protection of the innocent and the unborn in another. There is no middle ground between those two, that, that two, types of, of language. Um, 14 states have currently banned abortion outright in the, the US, 21 states still allow it, and 13 have new, have put in new protections specifically to allow this, this to continue. So you've got two different debates going on in different states, and within each state as well um, about this. Guns, the other big one, sadly, um, in the, the US. Uh, you've got a series of states passing stricter gun control legislation, trying to prevent guns coming into their states with very little success, it has to be said. And other states that are actively taking the position that more guns means safer Americans. Right? The only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun argument. Um, and again, you've got this playing out in, in different states. You've got it's our constitutional right to own weapons, it makes us safer, against people saying it makes us less safe, um, and actually there are limits on these things. Again, you've got this division going on without a middle ground that anybody has been able to, to find realistically. Um, we've got debates coming up about voting access, about voter ID laws, about gerrymandering, uh, about how we teach about, how the US teaches about race. So none of these things, right, broadly, again, turn the culture wars, are, are likely to spark into civil war immediately. Right? I, I don't think one of these issues is going to be the thing that creates the, the second American civil war. But I think it's important in thinking about them, either potentially in the context of a, a cold civil war or in terms of the historical parallels of the first civil war, as a way to think seriously about where American politics is it now and how people involved in it can perhaps take actions that might try to reduce the tensions and therefore reduce the, the likelihood of this happening in the future. Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, thank you for um, it's been, it's been great being here in Barcelona and this is listening to the work of um, and sharing ideas with the work of these uh, these scholars. Uh, thanks, thanks Jeff for the nice the kind of introduction. Um, I'm not a scholar, I'm, an, I'm a novelist. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my novel as a work of imagination. This is the novel by the way, it's called 2 a.m. in Little America. Um, I have to you know, show, show it. <laughs> Um, and um, it's not a literal depiction of a, I mean, we just heard how difficult it is to imagine those steps that would lead to an American Civil War. Being a, a novel writer, I don't have to imagine, I'm imagining the aftermath 
of some kind of civil disorder about which I am specifically um, not very um, uh, n non-specific. Um, the I'm not trying to write a future history. I say this is not a very commercial book. I'm not. I'm. I'm a, I'm a literary writer, I'm not a commercial writer, as my agent likes to remind me from time to time. Um, and um, um, I'm more or less focusing on the, on the aftermath of a national crack up, or a civil war, or a civil unrest, or whatever it is, and what it means to our sense of self, a sense of identity. Um, it's, 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 it's um, I don't mention Trump, I don't mention the political parties. Um, and the novel is not set in the United States. It's set in a foreign country that I don't name. Um, where there's an enclave of Americans, young Americans, who have fled, who have fled, um, who have fled the United States because of the violence, because of the economic collapse. And in, they've gone to a world that is not quite as friendly to Americans as they are now, you know? And like, now we live in a world as an American, I can travel to, to Barcelona and have a great time. And uh, you know, our passports are good everywhere, but not everyone has that privilege. So the novel reflects a little bit on that, um, that the loss of American power comes the loss of American privilege in living, in traveling abroad. Um, and I'm trying to capture sort of metaf metaphorically, sometimes comically, um, what a crack up might mean to feel like for for cer uh, certain characters in my in my book, um, and the sense of identity, the sense of reality. Um, because it's a novel, it comes from my own personal experience, and part of my personal experience was I lived in um, Belgrade, Yugoslavia, the first year of the civil war there. My wife's a journalist; she was covering the war. We lived there as the country fell apart. And it made a big impression on me. Um, I love Yugoslavia. It's a, it's, it was a great country, great people, uh, warm, cultured, smart. And um, they were torn apart by opposing narratives, heightened by, the, um, heightened by the news media of the time, which now seems almost quaint, the news media of the, of the late 80s or early 90s, um, you know, just a few networks and that, that kind of thing. But that that those those different media narratives for the Serbs for the um, for Croats for the other nationalities heighten these tensions in a way that's very uh, that meant a lot to me personally um, as something to w to worry about and my main idea in writing this book is that there's nothing special about America that means it couldn't happen to us there's nothing special about our um, institutions. I mean, there are, there are, we have great institutions, but nothing special about our uh, national character. That means we, we couldn't someday um, uh, crack up in, in, in some way. I don't say how. <laughs> Again, I'm mostly interested in, in, in exploring what it would mean for an average, for a certain American to live in a world that we was no longer a country, um, we was no longer a normal, a normal life. My character often thinks of himself as as living in abroad, while there's another another self living in a normal American country, going about his life, the life he expected to have. Um, and um, I see parallels. Now, I'm not saying a breakup with a breakup, a crack up in the United States would be like would would be like Yugoslavia, but it could be. And I was. And I, I, I was drawn, not. I mean, I, I began writing the novel before um, January sixth. I was, I was interested in in, in twenty um, fourteen. There was a, a, there was a, a confrontation, an armed confrontation in uh, Nevada, in um, in in Nevada. A guy named uh, uh, Clive Bundy, um, um, and his supporters were f were arguing with the federal the federal government about whether he could graze cattle on, on their land, and it came to the threat of violence. And um, at least temporarily, the, feds, the, fed, the feds, federal government backed down because they didn't want to have violence with this. But a couple of years later, his son went to, went to Oregon, and his and his supporters seized a federal facility um, in, the, in the 
you know, a wildlife, a wildlife refuge. You would not think a wildlife refuge <laughs> would be a, a would be a a a um, key a key uh, target for in insurrection, but they took it over for more than a month and they they, they trashed it, and um, these, you know, you know, we see evidence or we s we see examples of of or we can imagine um, militias and other and other um, parties uh, taking over federal or state or, or state offices or state institutions in order to to conduct their own policy, and um, and this and this is this kind of what happened in in Yugoslavia in the late eighties. We had mili you had militias taking over police stations, and you had you had um, the, the the provincial governments being. Being seized violently, and as we were talking about this last night, and Andy pointed out that the Civil War started the, the first civil, the American Civil War in, 19, in, eight, in 1861 with a seizure by with a seizure of of um, Fort, Sum, Fort Sumter, a uh, seizure of a federal facility, um, and that and the federal government could had to fight had to fight had to fight that back. So I think uh, in every country there are. Federal, you know, federal, federal institutions all over, state outposts all over the um, country, and they can be. See, so that was in my mind the, the again the Yugoslav um, example, um, and the second part of it was the issue of the refugees, and um, it's interesting, you know, in my book, the the Americans are are set adrift there. They've they've left the country. They no longer have the protections of their passport that they once had. Not every, not every country welcomes the passports. Uh, most of this novel takes place in, a, in an enclave where a lot of Americans have, have, mig have, have, um, have settled in a country that still tolerates them. And the character thinks of this little enclave as little America. That they have yogurt shops there and you know, frozen yogurt shops and, and they, 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 people speak English and Spanish and um, there's, there's, you know, but but it, it's a very um, uh, fragile existence. So um, I was trying to imagine that I I should note that in my novel the the migrants the the migrants the American migrants um, who have found themselves as refugees are not treated as badly or not treated are treated in better circumstances for the most part than the the refugees coming to the United States on our southern border. Um, again, um, I was thinking a little bit of, of Bo uh, Bosnia and how a lot of Bosnian refugees came to Europe, especially, and with some difficulty, but eventually settled here, made lives, you know, and and um, um, in my imagination for the purposes of, purpose of this novel, um, the Americans do suffer hardships, but uh, um, they, they they do create lives in these foreign in these foreign countries, um, and uh, um, um, I should say that the book is a meta again metaphorical and elusive. Um, what I'm trying, what I'm most interested in, in terms of a writer, is the way we misapprehend the world. Most of my novels usually involve people making mistakes of some sort, and. Um, you know, I, I want to separate the experience of a national breakup from the politics and from the issues and just try to imagine what it's like to, 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 to live in a country that has um, broken up, that has suffered these, 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 these um, you know, what it means for your self-identity. And um, also the disorientation of being a, refu a refugee and what it's like to all of a sudden be out of your country. Not an expat, I've, I've lived abroad, but if, you've, if you're forced out of your country, you're, there's a certain, there's a certain uh, disorientation. The world is no longer a comf comf you know, comfortable place for you. And um, the dissonance also of living in an environment in which objective fact is contested, which we, we all are f have become familiar with. So my book, um, so my novel tries to deal with those issues, hopefully in a, in a entertaining and uh, 
occasionally amusing way. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Right, so that's quite a lot to uh, chew over. Um, and before I sort of open it up for questions, I sort of take the liberty of asking one of my own. Um, so, you know, we've talked about, you know, I'm sort of just curious, I mean, promoting violence, we, you know, we sort of have anger at the government, hatred of the political opposition, et cetera. Sometimes this, you know, it, this can be seen as a political strategy. It's a political, you know, the, you know, it's a deliberate political strategy because it seems to be a vote winner. Now, if this is the case, one can perhaps see that sort of this, this going in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, there might be some control over this. Uh, the politicians will know when they've gone too far. Basically, at some point, it just becomes too unprofitable for them, it becomes too risky, and so forth. Uh, perhaps when things get too violent, you know, the first bombs go off, they start to draw back, maybe a few less, few, few less lies and conspiracy theories, uh, and so forth. On the other hand, there might be no control over this. Uh, the angry rhetoric keeps increasing. For one reason or another, the federal government chooses to stand aside and things spiral out of control. So my question for all of you is, is this controllable? Is there a point where things have gone too far? Can the existing system continue to function as it has? You know, sort of this muddle through approach? Or are we on some sort of runaway train that's going to end in disaster? I'd just be very curious about your opinions. Um, so yeah, a good question, obviously. I mean, I think my comments indicated that I, I do think that um, there's enough guardrails in place to, again, keep things somewhat under control. I, um, I don't, I think what happened on January 6th um, would have happened to some degree regardless. And I think as Andy rightly pointed out, um, it was more the challenge to democracy even more than the, the physical actions that maybe um, deserve more attention. But I would say there's, there were tactical decisions made that day too. And I think there were lessons learned from some of those decisions in terms of how, um, how we do security and how we prepare for things. And, and, and it's not that um, not the US didn't have the means or that Capitol Police didn't have, have the means. There was um, some shortcomings there that, that the Capitol Police ended up being overrun. But I, I do think that we have multi-levels of law enforcement that many do their jobs very well. As I noted in my remarks, they don't often coordinate that well, but I think January 6th underscored the need for them to do that better, and there are efforts being made in that regard. Um, you know, Andy, I think, rightly pointed out in his comments this kind of distinction between national military level and state guards. And we've seen um, a little playing around with state guards um, in, in Florida in, 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 in kind of recent times under DeSantis, but so far that has not been really uh, seized upon or deployed in any kind of way. And I would hope that it would not be. And I, I would say that both parties, however far apart they are, most have respect for the military. And that's usually something that, that is not something that um, either party wants to completely shake up. So. For me, policing, military, and rule of law are three areas where I think the U.S. has hope for maintaining guardrails for the kind of violence that might um, that might emerge. Yeah, and so in, uh, to build on that, I would say that this type of violence has always existed in American history. And sometimes it has posed a threat to people's lives and property. And sometimes it has posed a political threat to the control uh, exercised by state governments or by the federal government. And I think that, to, re to respond to Jeff's question, that I don't think that that societal violence is controllable. So I think that throughout American history, it's always been there, and I don't see any reason to think that it's going to go away anytime soon. You know, in its, its modern variant is this militia movement, which is kind of a post-Vietnam War phenomenon. But the times when we start talking about civil war or we start talking about coups or insurgencies or insurrections is often, in my mind, when that private violence becomes, um, I was going to say nationalized. It's not necessarily nationalized because sometimes it's just within a particular state, right? But I mean, for instance, Jim Crow, 
was in, for, in the southern states, this system of controlling and, and suppressing black people's civil rights after the Civil War, that was a combination of private violence which was supported by state institutions. So I think that it takes political leaders to take this to the next level. It takes state or federal authority to take this to the level where we start talking about a threat to American democracy and a threat to the American Constitution. Because as long as the institutions of the state stand against this, then I don't think it has any, any hope of overcoming them. But many, many times in American history, we do see that political actors ally with these private groups to advance particular goals. And that's what, in my mind, makes Donald Trump so dangerous that, that he shows the, the willingness to do that. And I think if Donald Trump went away tomorrow and nobody else like Donald Trump emerged, then I would say that this threat is controllable, right? The threat of a, a, to the American state is controllable. But that private violence will always be there because it always has been in American history. Thanks. Um, just to think about putting that in a, a slightly different context. Um, I think the structures of American government have held right, up until this point, even though there's lots of discussion when Donald Trump was elected in 2016, it's like, now he's, he's been elected, he'll be reined in by the, you know, the powers of the constitution and by the institutions of government. And what we saw is that actually he largely wasn't. <laughs> or, you know, I suppose you can't prove the negative of what might have happened had things gone further. But, um, you know, we, we know that he managed to certain, to use things to his own advantage. Um, and I don't think we should downplay actually the damage to American institutions that he, he and his supporters have done whether that's trust in the media, whether that's trust in government, whether that's the suspicion of the Supreme Court. Um, all of those things have taken pretty big hits in the, the last few years. And that's not to say that's new. I'm not, you know, things are on a sort of downward trajectory, but they, they certainly speeded it up a lot. So I, th I think, yes, the, the institutions of government have held, but that doesn't mean they always will. Um, and I think we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't take that for, take for granted that because it's happened in the past, it will will happen again in the future. Um, and I guess just to to think about the idea of sort of politicians and and whether it can be controlled um, or something like this could could be controlled. It can be controlled up until the point it can't, um, which sounds like a ridiculous thing to say because it's so true. But um, but the point is, at what point do you realise that it's got out of control and I'm not sure you people involved in it will necessarily know that until the point at which it can be reined back has passed and you see it with hindsight. Um, now that might be just my slightly more negative thinking about it but I mean I look at, at some of the Rep some in the Republican Party for example who supported Donald Trump's claims that the 2020 election was stolen, even though there is no evidence of it. And they, qu they, some of them quite clearly understood that there was no evidence of it. Some of the information that we've had from people of Fox News and in recent years, uh, recent months, in fact, have shown that uh, they don't necessarily always believe everything that they, they say. I mean, and that, I think, is actually really dangerous. If you've not got politicians saying things that fundamentally damage the institutions of democracy to make a political point, I have some skepticism that those are the people we expect to be able to say, oops, maybe we've gone too far, maybe we need to rein it back before we get to a point where we can't do that anymore. So I, I, I worry about that with the current generation of politicians in the, the US. Um. I think it actually is a runaway train, uh, runaway train which is hilarious since the service in, train service in America is so lousy. Um, but uh, in terms of our rhetoric, I, I mean, any if the pol uh, this new breed of politicians, if there's um, if, a, if there's a, if there's a if there's a possibility of um, of getting power. They're going to, they're 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 going to they're going to take it. Maybe politics have always been like that, but I think we've seen uh, at a level that um, that I I do think I, I do think it's I do think there's a heightened rhetoric, heightened sense of unreality, the the lack the lack of you know the 
the the, the lack of objective uh, of leaving ob objective truth. Um, so I do think it's kind of a runaway train. I, I do agree with with Julie about the institutions still being still being very strong. I mean, I think I do think we do have those institutions, and that's still something to to be aware of that. But in terms of rhetoric and the political um, climate. So I published, I published three novels, um, each about this third, this third one, but each about changes in the media that have changed our way of thinking about society. The, I mean, the first one was set in Russia. It was by the, it, by the invention of film propaganda that made us see, that made us believe things we knew were not true. Um, then my, my second novel is sort of comedy by 9-11. Um, and it's, 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 it's about how in this new 24-7 media environment, we confuse the public and, pri and, private, and private reality. And now we, we've entered a new realm of social media. And that's changed our susceptibility to rhetoric, to, to propaganda, and um, you know, I, I'm not predicting what's going to what's going to happen, but I don't think I think our institutions will will be there, f the neutral institutions like the police and the and the and the and the um, army or whatever. You know, those those institutions will be there for us long after the politicians to say, okay, I can, get, I can get power like this. And I think I've got several Republican candidates who are running now, and they're all looking at what Trump did, and they will try to uh, promise t to do it better. Um, so uh, in that respect, I think the rhetoric is, and that's not only in America, I think it's all over the world, and you know, maybe even here in Spain as well. So um, um, I think it's a feature of our, techno of our media technology, actually. Hello, okay, perfect. Well, first of all, thank you, Jeff, for organizing this, and thank you all for your insights. It's indeed a very timely topic, unfortunately. But out of all of the factors that were discussed, uh, all of these endogenous factors that underpin American political stability, one thing that I did notice was absent were exogenous factors. And two key words come to mind. One is, well, you mentioned, we talked a lot about civil war, but what about revolution? And when we discuss, uh, in keeping in the topic of exogenous factors, what about the geopolitics there? Now, uh, to, to illustrate the, the point, and, you know, drawing a little bit on the fantasy word that's in the title, naturally, I mean, no one's thinking that the Proud Boys are going to gain enough capability to seriously challenge the United States government as it stands, right? But what if one of these pillars of power decreases? Uh, as a, an example out of the top of my head, what if uh, either gradually or suddenly the United States government loses its capacity to issue a global reserve currency? Now, in this scenario where it's capability to maintain this security infrastructure, first abroad and possibly later on domestically, and in parallel, something like, uh, you know, people simply stop believing in the mechanisms of uh, social improvement. They simply lose faith in the dollar. In this, again, fantasy scenario, what would be the more likely outcome? Would we be talking meaningfully about a civil war over territory and ideology, or would this uh, you know, small change in the political reality that the United States be more conducive to something akin to a revolution? What would be the geopolitical consequences of this? And I guess, uh, you know, to, to wrap it up, absent money, if that were no longer the case, or if this capacity were significantly weakened, would the rest be enough as a bulwark to maintain this political stability, in your opinion? Thank you. <laughs>
can take a stab. Um, Great, thank you so much for, for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the cop-out answer is it depends, right? I mean, you're talking about exogenous shocks or exogenous variables, it really depends on the variable. But I would say, first, the dollar question is not totally far-fetched because as, if you're here in this room, you probably know it came quite close to the debt ceiling um, cliff last week, which actually could have had a big impact on what the dollar meant globally. So that those kinds of economic scenarios are not as fantastical as they might seem. My sense is that often exogenous um, shocks like that, if anything, dampen some of the civil war tendencies because there's a sort of rally around the flag or cohesion kind of effect that needs to happen because we're all in this other crisis together and we kind of need to put a pin in the culture wars or whatever is like Trump is saying that day because there's actually this like crisis at the moment. So again, if it's something that's severe that actually brings people together, that can be the effect. But we've seen other um, exogenous shocks that then become a wedge issue. And I would say the Ukraine war is a good example. It's one that initially seemed like it'd be one that most Americans would agree on. Um, and foreign policy is often where we have more overlap between the parties. But that has increasingly become a wedge issue as one large contingent of the Republican Party has become uh, much more um, hostile to aid to Ukraine. So those are kind of two, uh, two different takes on, on how that might play out. Anyone else want to take that one? Uh, the gentleman at the front of you. Um, yeah, th this is on. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, the talk and um, for this discussion. First of all, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, my impression of the Civil War, the original Civil War in the U.S., was that it was predicated by changes in uh, economic structure of the United States, particularly the industrialization of the North. Um, I'm not so convinced that th there was uh, sort of a, a humanist motivation behind the abolition of slavery, right? I think it had much to do with needing consumers and needing employees, therefore, um, rather than slaves. Um, and. Uh, or in any case, that there was a large change in the uh, economic structure of the United States and globally at the time. Um, today we have uh, similar changes in the media, uh, in social media, which are also industrial changes, which are also changes to how the economy globally and in the United States works. So I was wondering if um, the way that you see Industry 4.0 or um, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, if this in some, in some way contributes to tensions heightening, if it contributes to the probability of uh, more conflict in the United States or less. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, with the, um, the American Civil War, these economic changes that you talked about were definitely part of what was happening but the way that I understand it and we talked about this a bit last night was that it was fundamentally a question of who would control federal power in the United States and you had two competing visions for the future of the country one of which was based on a slave economy and one of which was not based on a slave economy was 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 based on putatively free labor and these two visions came to be seen as completely incompatible. The, the, you know, Lincoln in his famous speech said, a house divided against itself cannot stand and the United States will ultimately be all slave or all free. And many people in the North believed that there was a chance that the South might eventually force the adoption of slavery across the entire United States. Dred Scott seemed to suggest that Congress could not constitutionally say that slavery could not exist in certain states. So that I don't see today a similar conflict over political economy, even though in the United States there is now clearly very, di there are very divergent paths been taken by different parts of the country, some of which are benefiting from the fourth industrial revolution, some of which are suffering from the deindustrialization and, and kind of the, the movement to this new type of economy. That the winners and losers in that again are distributed across the United States. Um, you know, and it, it's not a sectional thing. It's not a thing where there's one I mean, obviously, th this is to some extent a regional um, 
you know, a regional thing, but I don't see the ex emergence of the same blocks in the same way, and I don't see the emergence of the same existential stakes that have been invested in this debate over political economy, whereas slavery was something that seemed to have an existential um, quality for the North as, as well as for the South. So, I mean, you know, obviously we, we all know about arguments about how social media drives polarization and, and, and things like this, and I think that is all absolutely true and that these are um, effects of the communications revolution and, and of social media, but I don't see it leading to that kind of breakdown based on political economy in the, in the same way. I mean, I, I'm going to try to, well, I, I understand what, yeah, I, I mean, I do think it just, it, I was thinking before about social media and how it, not much as much as part of the economy, though it's actually an interesting question to, to wonder how, um, but I haven't thought about it, about how the media, you know, but, about how value has, has changed for different, for, for different media and what, what that might mean, but in terms of, Political rhetoric is what I'm really, and you know, what's what we can talk about is something called the Overton Window. Is that something that you've talked about? Uh, it's this idea that that there's a amazing. I don't even know this. Um, that there's that, that, that in every society there's a there's a, there's a there's a certain window of of political of what's permissible political debate, and that window can get bigger or 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 smaller. Um, and um, one thing Trump did was open up that window so that things that were once that were once um, were once not even on the table have become on the table. This really isn't directly in question to your question about 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 the economy, but but this is why I think that is social media is very powerful and does change the debate, and um, we've seen that in the last several years. Um, thanks, Jeff, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I wanted to pick up, I guess, about what Andy was saying about the metaphor of the Civil War and whether that might be masking more likely scenarios, for example, just state collapse, that at some point in the future, the US system will just become ungovernable because of the differences in the ideologies that are driving the, the, the main parties. And that if we imagine a, a future scenario, for example, Trump winning in, in 2024, it would actually just be potentially a situation where there will not necessarily be violence, but there would just be ideas that this, the two ideologies could no longer be contained within one state. And that from there, we do not know what the next steps would be. They probably would be nothing like a, a violent conflict like the original civil war, but there would just be potentially, and this is one of the, the, the points I kind of was, I'm interested in, because I don't think anyone really brought it up, was it's not necessarily just the Proud Boys or the right who might have a, a it might be the trigger for a conflict for the collapse of the United States, but from the progressive side, there might be a desire to just say, well, the US federal government has historically been a force for progressivism, for imposing or trying to stop slavery in the South and whatever, but we've reached a point where we no longer want to use the federal government or we don't see the federal government as able to introduce a, a progressive ideology anymore. It's now just an, it's an albatross to control the state government. And maybe progressives would say, it's time we leave. And there could be the departure of, I mean, I admit, as you, Andy said, there's lots of <coughs> geographical problems with this, but you could see some states just saying, we no longer want to be part of the United States because we want to live in a society which whatever, recognizes abortion, gives basic rights, which some states also just they are not, at this point, seemingly aligned in, in their political tra trajectory of what, what their respect for human rights uh, will follow. So, yeah, that's my question. Um, 
Yeah, well, I, th I think they're really good points. And to, to kind of talk about um, the first one a little bit, so I absolutely do think that, you know, among the more plausible scenarios about how things could go very bad in the United States is precisely what you're talking about, that you have a situation where one half or a significant portion of the country comes to view the federal government as illegitimate, right? And I completely agree that that actually in certain scenarios could be progressive because it could be that Trump took power in some way that was illegitimate or that they view as illegitimate. And that then it might be the case that, um, you know, California says, okay, well, we're not going to follow this Supreme Court decision or, well, sorry, that would be in the case of a Supreme Court decision or they say, we're not going to accept this election result. And I actually saw um, sometime last year, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, actually made an argument along these lines about um, the Supreme Court. You probably remember the name of the case, but the latest Supreme Court gun case uh, that, that was handed down last year. And I actually drafted an op-ed and, and tried to get, no one would publish it, but I tried to get someone to publish it saying, you know, this is, a, this is really dangerous, you know, because actually if progressives give up on the federal government, if they give up on the idea that controlling the federal government and, and um, using it wisely is a necessary thing in modern America, then actually that has terrible consequences for, for the future of America. And, but I, what I tend to think would happen in the case of um, this, kind of, this kind of crack up where a large part of the country comes to view the federal government as illegitimate, I think that, so that, that leads to two things. It, it leads firstly to a conflict over the writ of federal law and of federal court decisions, in particular states. Now, historically, the way that the federal government has dealt with that is that it has sent the military into those states to enforce those court decisions, as happened during the, the civil rights movement. So that scenario seems to me unsustainable. I, that, that's not, that would be like, uh, the forces would be balanced like this, then they would tip over into something else. I don't think that that situation could continue for a long time, because the federal government would attempt to enforce its writ. And it would may perhaps be resisted and then God knows what would happen. But I think that that is a plausible um, scenario for, for how things could turn badly in the US. And it wouldn't exactly be a civil war. It wasn't a civil war when Eisenhower sent paratroopers to integrate schools in Little Rock, but it was a constitutional crisis of, of some kind. And I, I agree with you, because I think this was your fundamental point, that talking about a civil war masks and distracts from these much more plausible and concerning scenarios. So that's what I think. It's interesting. Um, there's a, a slightly less negative spin on <laughs> this version, I suppose. Since we went down the line and got more negative as we went, I feel like I need to balance it off slightly. Um, the US is a federal system, right? And it allows for it allows rooms for differences between states. Now, the history of the 20th and the 21st centuries, at least since the crisis of the Great Depression and um, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s, followed by then World War II and the, the Cold War, has been that power has moved to the center through US history. You know, when I talk to my students, when I teach my students sort of late 18th and early 19th century American history, they find it quite hard to grasp how little power the federal government actually had in that period, because that's not what we're used to anymore. So there, there is a version of this that doesn't necessarily end up in a kind of constitutional crisis, but a kind of return to a version of federalism, where states have more power, where actually the lack of agreement finds an agreement in we agree that the federal government does not get involved in certain issues and we return them back to the, the states. Um, sort of a, a 19th century version of what the federal government would, would be. Um, so whether you're talking about regulation of economic issues or whether you're talking about abortion or whether you're talking about criminal justice or gun, guns or whatever issue there, there is, um, that's a you know, that, that's a scenario that could potentially be contained within the system as it exists in the same way that the system contained the growth of the, the federal government. Um, 
so I, I suppose it's just a, another way of, of thinking about it. You know, it, it could very considerably go exactly the way that you're suggesting, which is that everybody loses faith in the federal government completely and it just, or they abdicate from it by saying it can't do anything anymore. We, we can't convince these people and things fall apart. But if people were thinking about how it might be pulled back a little bit, um, that there is room within the constitutional system to allow those kinds of differences to play out if everybody agrees that that's how they, they do it. That's how the US was founded in the first place. Um, yes, uh, a few of you have mentioned the power and polar polarizing effect of social media and social networks. Um, and I wanted to raise the fact that we now have an additional layer of technology at our fingertips uh, in the form of large language generative uh, uh, AI models. Um, in, and vis-a-vis -vis the next election, the possibility that misinformation is going to be created at a massive scale using these tools, you know, because before it took an individual working, you know, day and night to produce a piece that looked credible. Now it takes seconds to generate something that is entirely convincing and compelling. Um, so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what impact you see that having yeah. in the future. I think it's enormous. I think it's the next big media, uh, next next big shock to our system of ourselves and, our, and how it have a political effect on us. I mean, this disinformation next year, it potentially, I mean, there'll be, there'll be deep fakes, you know, there'll be, and once you see something, once you see something, once someone, when you see propaganda that you, that you kind of believe the, you kind of believe the um, idea behind it, even if you know, even even <coughs> even if you know it's been manipulated, you still believe it, and it still has an impact on you. And I think um, that's everything we're talking about has to be put in context in the next election with the power of AI, with the power of, of manipulation of images beyond anything we've seen before. So yeah, I do think it's a, I mean, I think, I think the next, the next big um, shock to the, uh, next big shock to the system, yeah. Um, I, the, there's a question, I mean, I'm a notorious technophobe. If you ask my, my friends and my colleagues, they'll tell you that um, if I can do it in an analog version, I will. <laughs> um, so I, I may not be the best person to answer, but um, I mean, th there's a real question about with deep fakes and you know AI and all the rest of it, which is what happens if you get to a point where you can't disting easily distinguish between the two, when you can't trust that something within an election, you know, when, when something within an election campaign, you don't know, did that actually come from the party that I'm supporting? Or has it been created by someone to look like it has? Or has it been created by someone to look like it's coming from the opposition? I mean, we saw, we've seen a little bit about this on social media, right, in, in the last couple of elections and, you know, people being reeled in by fake accounts um, with, with fake propaganda. But, you know, the, the risk of, of AI is you know, the um, suspicion of, the mainstream media is already at a, a historic low in the US and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, so if you haven't got a media source that you trust to go to and then you add misinformation or disinformation on top of that, you know, that's a, a really worrying concern. And I think the um, there have been some comments I know from people who know much more about this than me, which is not hard. Um, from from people involved in this to sort of say you know the the regulation of AI is something we need to seriously think about and and consider and, and so on, which suggests that they have some concerns and that maybe the next step is about finding ways to distinguish between what has been created that way and what what hasn't. But whether that can be done before the next election cycle is mm, something I I could speculate on, but 
not anything, but yeah, I think it's a, a really worrying <coughs> development. Thank you. Thank you all for this great discussion. Um, so I wanted to ask those of you, well, particularly those of you who live in Europe, sorry, Ken. Um, my basic question is how the American dysfunction, whether it's called the Civil War or something else, has been digested and processed and received by Europeans. And in, the, in that context, I just note that obviously there's a lot of political stresses and strains in Europe, and there have been for many years. There are secessionist movements and have been ongoing in, in Spain, in Italy, um, in Belgium, you know, regional tensions that, that would seem to pull apart countries, and yet I don't know um, if there have been such panels about, uh, you know, a new, a new Italian civil war, a new French civil war, or a new Belgian civil war. I, I tend to doubt that you have, there have been such academic conferences, all, although I guess there could be academic conferences about anything. Um, and yet here we are in Europe talking about the possibility or the fantasy or the, of American <coughs> crack, crack up or break up or civil war. And so my question is, how do Europeans, your impressions of how Europeans process and understand this American dysfunction? Um, I guess I, I can start. Um, from my point of view, I think that there are two groups, right? There's the, the group of people who aren't that interested in the United States and kind of look on as if this is some kind of um, play at a distance that is fascinating to, to watch the collapse of this country that they've known for so long as, as being so powerful and important. And in some cases, some people thinking that maybe it's right that they, they've taking themselves down a peg or two because they've tried to dictate things to the rest of the world for far too long. Um, so I think that there's sort of one, one group of, of people who are perhaps less invested in it. Um, and then there's a, there are others, um, whether that's colleagues of mine where we, we, we are teaching American history and politics, where we're actively engaged with it, where we're, we're perhaps paying more attention to, to the, the, the consequent, what the, the wider consequences of this might be for the United States, but also for the rest of the, the world. Um, I think on one hand, there's, there's puzzlement. Um, one of the things that my students ask a lot is, why do so many people keep supporting Donald Trump? Um, you know, why, why wasn't he impeached? I think there's a, a view, certainly, in the UK, and let's face it, in the UK, we've got our own problems. Um, but this kind of sense of, like, why, why have they not got rid of him? Why is he still so influential? Why is he important? Just genuinely don't get it. Can't understand why, given everything that we know, they've not done that. Um, and then there's, a, a, I guess, another group within that small sort of the smaller group of people paying attention to what's going on in the US who I think are genuinely concerned about what this this means um, about whether this this is kind of a cycle of a reduction in power but the, the US will in, endure but others will will kind of step in both geopolitically and and domestically um, or you know whether the loss of the, the US and the, the power that it has had destabilizes a great deal of other things. Now, obviously, we're spec we, you can only speculate about that at the moment. So I don't know that there's a sort of a sing simple, straightforward response, but uh, to your, your question about how, how people, particularly in the UK, are responding. But there's a, a sort of a range that go from the, we're very, very worried about this through to, it's kind of fun to watch it from a distance, but we're not that that concerned. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I just like to say something briefly about one specific aspect of this story, which is the way that European policymakers and foreign policymakers and, and the European Union has, has reacted to all of this, which is that, you know, I think as we know during the Trump presidency, there was a great deal of concern in Europe about the reliability of America as an, as an ally and as kind of the, um, provider of security to, to Europe. I think that the election of Biden and then the war in Ukraine has led that conversation to go away and it should not have gone away. 
because you know where um, I'm based in the Netherlands and, and next door in Germany, people are many people are very very resistant to the idea that the European Union needs to develop its own capabilities to be a strategic actor in the world because they want to maintain this connection to the United States. But I think actually the war in Ukraine has shown that. Europe is in this still very much subordinate, almost vassalized position vis-a-vis -vis the United States that really Europe is not involved in strategic questions about the war in Ukraine. Europe wasn't even involved in some of these, uh, you know, the, the meetings that the US tried to have with Russia before the war to try to find a solution. Europe wasn't even in those meetings, right? And I think that it's very, very important that, in my view, that the European Union realize that this is not going away and that the US in the future is not necessarily going to be the ally that, that it was in the past. But I think that that conversation has been swept under the rug in, in a way that's profoundly damaging and, and, and short-sighted at the moment. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I would add on to that also. I think January 6th obviously rattled Europe a lot. The Trump years obviously rattled Europe very much. I would say I do think um, the war in Ukraine, I think, uh, pivoted attention away from that a little bit uh, more quickly than maybe it would have otherwise. Um, and whatever smugness there might have been, I think kind of took a back seat to, as Andy pointed out, the coordination slash reliance on the U.S. to respond to Ukraine and be the primary um, contributor of military aid in particular. I think Biden's particular tack on that has been to work very much in coordination with European allies, which they have, um, I think, has, has worked well. But um, I think everyone is very keenly aware that this could be a very um, short-lived U.S. foreign policy if Biden is not reelected in 2024 and that things could change very soon. So everything that the U.S. does right now, whether it's on Ukraine or any other issue, everyone's, I think, just mindful that, uh, a bit wary of it because they know it may change quickly. And um, just to Andy's point too, I'm hearing a lot more in Europe about um, U.S. takes on, on China and if, um, you know, if Europe's going to have to kind of pick a side and how much to be aligned. And, and Macron made some very uh, uh, forward comments about that, but I think we're shared by many Europeans. We could get off on foreign policy stuff, I think, on another conversation. But um, but I just say yes, I think people are paying attention, and I think uh, we're all aware 2024 is going to be um, a very important election, not just for the U.S. but for Europe and the world. So, new American Civil War, realistic possibility or fantasy? I really don't know my answer to that question after this absolutely superb panel. Uh, I think I'm sort of veering more towards still on more on the fantasy end or whether just just get rid of the Civil War terminology altogether because it's just unhelpful and we have sort of the wrong images and so forth. Uh, but on the other hand, as was mentioned, uh, um, uh, I think by Emma, uh, you know, you don't think it's going to happen until it actually happens. Uh, you know, all the indicators, you know, you, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen, but then something s suddenly just happens, uh, things that were not even thought possible before, like January 6th or something like this. Um, I think that's sort of the question that was asked at the end about sort of European views of, of the U.S. One thing that we didn't really talk too much today about, although it was sort of brought up a bit in the end, was this issue of how do other countries view the stability of the United States, and especially how do foreign businesses actually view the stability of the United States? Are they still investing in the ways that they used to, or do they sort of thinking, well, maybe there's something up, maybe it's a bit too risky, like some other country that has a, sort of a very poor political risk um, analysis associated with it. We're now at quarter to six, so I'm afraid I do have to draw this session to a close. I would just ask you to join me in a round of thanks and applause to our speakers. Thank you very much.